Welcome, one and all. Thank you for joining us this evening for One Book, One SFU, featuring Joshua Whitehead, author of Johnny Appleseed in conversation with Vivek Shreya. My name is Gwen Bird, and I'm Dean of Libraries at Simon Fraser University. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you this evening. It's also my pleasure to pass the virtual microphone now to Elder Sequoia of the Squamish Nation to open for us this evening. Elder Sequoia. Kayochtin. That means welcome in the Squamish language. And I welcome you to all of you to the ancestral traditional lands of the Squamish Nation, my nation, Tsleil-Waututh and SFU Burnaby campus is also shares um, jointly the Coquitlam First Nation and Musqueam First Nation. And I welcome and honor all of you who are zooming into the webinar from um, the tr ancestral traditional lands where you live, work and play. And um, it's an honor to be here to open you this evening and to be able to um, say that I, you know, hope you have a wonderful discussion and get a lot out of sharing time with the author Joshua Whitehead and be able to transfer knowledge and be able to learn from each other. And so I'm going to, uh, my elders taught me from Squamish that we all have an energy with inside ourselves and we receive energy from creator through the top of our head and it comes into us. And if we believe in it enough, we can send our energy out to others and we can also in a way help to heal our own selves with that energy. And so when we spiritually, we're spiritual people pray, you can't block your energy. So you can't have your arms like this crossed or your hands like this or this because you're blocking your energy from receiving the prayers and energy from creator when I pray and um, from each other. And you can send that energy because our elders believe no matter where we are, we can send our energy to someone who's way far away. So virtually, it's not any different when we send energy to each other. So I'm going to ask you to come together in Chomo and Chihuahuan, phrase of, from our people, Squamish, that means one heart and one mind. And to Chen Chen Stwight, stand and work together, support one another and help each other. That's us, what that Squamish word means. And pray together in a spiritual way. I'm going to sing Sequali song, greeting of the day. And then I'll share a prayer and then I'll turn you back over to Gwen and let you enjoy your evening. And I apologize now, I won't be staying with you. I've had a long day. I've been going since 8.30 this morning. So I'm ready to cook a late dinner and um, know that you're going to have an enjoyable time. So I always say, um, so you don't go like this. Let's do Tai Chi or yoga breathing. Open your hands and take a couple breaths and ground yourself. And when I sing, I'm going to ask you to pray for each other and for your family and friends. When I finish, I'll say the prayer and then I'll let you get to your gathering. Oh.
chaka, hoy chaka. Chen quen mentomi kakakanak chesiam, yoncio on so tenoyop and manman desquiles deceits, yoncio manman equato che, si ayay che, squalwen. In English, what I just shared with you is thank you, Creator. Watch over and guide each and every one of your children gathered here tonight and protect them and take care of their squall and the feelings in their hearts and minds. It's one thing, squalling. And also of their family, Equatolche, and their friends, Siayaiche. And put a shield around them to protect them as they go forward into the evening and the rest of the week. Asking you, Creator, to hear um, our prayers for all our family and friends that have serious illnesses, injuries, waiting for surgery or have had surgery, anxiety or depression. Hear our prayers for them, for their health, healing and recovery. Hear our prayers, Creator, for all our family and friends who have traumas and battle alcohol and drugs. And for those who, because of their traumas and battles, are homeless. And protect those who use um, um, the illegal substances because the supply is dangerous right now and taking lives in the last two weeks. So pray that they're all safe and protected and hear our prayers creator for their um for them to find the healing path to wellness and recovery and prayers for all their families who and friends who worry about them to send our energy and prayers to lift them up and lighten their squall and their feelings in their hearts and minds. And because it's Easter weekend, Creator, hear our prayers to their loved ones to contact them either directly or through someone else to let their family know that they're safe and all right. Hear our prayers, Creator, for all our family and friends who have lost loved ones and to help them with our prayers and energy to lift them up in their time of sorrow and to know that the healing it'll ease and they'll remember their loved ones with happiness and joy of the memories in their hearts and minds and to always know creator let everyone know that our loved ones send spiritual help their guardian angels and they'll send you signs when you're low in spirit Maybe it'll be in Dragonfly. Many of our people believe that their ancestors visiting or a ladybug or a butterfly, they say those are family visiting. Hummingbird, eagle, or maybe a song on the radio or while you're shopping that and you're feeling low or heavy from work and you hear the song and you remember a loved one in the good times you had. And that's them spiritually lifting your squalling up. So always know they're your guardian angels. Again, Creator, watch over and protect everyone and um, take care of them and let them have a yet one halt day top and excellent work tonight, sharing good discussion. Tama Quetzi, those are my words. Chen Quen Mentomi. I'm to tell me up. I'm grateful and thankful to all of you for letting me share a bit of your time this evening. And as my late son, who I lost in 2018, used to say, top left from my heart, I send you love, peace, and air hugs. Wachayap yo, you all take care. Hoichka, Elder Sequoia, thank you so much for starting us off. 
Uh, for those just joining us, my name is Gwen Bird, and I'm Dean of University. It's my privilege to welcome you to this year's One Book, One SFU event. Hello, everyone. So sorry about that. It looks like we have lost Gwen and uh, she should be rejoining us very shortly. But I do know that she wanted to get us started and say that we do have ASL interpretation available for you tonight. Uh, you should be seeing it on your screens as we go. We do also have closed captioning available. You can access that by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen. And uh, we'll get started with our One Book, One SFU event very, very shortly. Um, I'm just going to stop for a moment and we'll get Gwen back on board. It'll just take a minute. So sorry about the delay, everyone. I'm just going to invite Anne McDonald to uh, join us on screen. And she will step in for Gwen here very shortly. Thank you so much, Anne. Hi everyone, thanks very much for joining us tonight. Um, sorry, just give me one second here. Um, welcome to the 2021 version of uh, our um, One Book, One SFU event. Um, we hold this event every year uh, and we are thrilled that this year we are welcoming Joshua Whitehead and Vivek Shreya 
to speak to you all. We'd like to say a, a quick thank you to SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement, SFU Public Square, and Pulp, Pulp Fiction Books for being our partners in this event. Um, I'd like to also uh, remind all of you um, that we do have an event code of contact conduct that you will have received when you signed up for this event. So if you're not familiar with it, please feel free to take a look at it now. Um, at this point, I'd like to invite, um, sorry, just a minute. Everyone is welcome to use the chat throughout the event. And please use the Q&A to leave questions for our speakers as there will be a brief Q&A period at the end of the evening. All right, now I would like to introduce our speakers. One moment, please. Um, I'd like to introduce Joshua Whitehead, who is a Two-Spirit member of the Pequis First Nations in Treaty 1. He is currently a PhD candidate lecturer and Killam Scholar at the University of Calgary, where he studies Indigenous literatures and cultures with a focus on gender and sexuality. His dissertation, tentatively titled Feral Fatalisms, is a hybrid narrative of the theory, essay, and nonfiction that interrogates the role of ferality inherent within Indigenous ways of being. He is the author of Full Metal Indigiqueer uh, that was published by Talon Books in 2017 that was shortlisted for the inaugural Indigenous Voices Award and the Stefan G. Stephenson Award for Poetry. He's also the author of Johnny Appleseed, and we'll hear a lot more about that book tonight. That was published by Arsenal Pulp Press 2018, long listed for the Giller Prize, short listed for the Indigenous Voices Award, the Governor General's Literary Award, the Amazon Canada First Novel Award, the Karen Shields, Carol Shields Winnipeg Book Award, and won the Lambda Literary Award for Gay Fiction and the George Bonnier Award for Fiction. As you probably know, it's all also won the CBC Canada Reads um, title for 2021 and has uh, rocketed to the top of the, Can the Canadian fiction bestsellers list. Uh, Joshua is currently working on a third manuscript entitled Making Love with the Land to be published by Knopf Canada, which explores the intersections of indigeneity, queerness, and most prominently mental health through uh, an Indigenous lens. Cur currently, Whitehead is premiering his newly edited anthology, Love After the End, an anthology of two-spirit and Indigiqueer speculative fiction. You can find more of his work published widely in such venues as Prairie Fire, CV2, Event, Arc Poetry Magazine, The Fiddlehead, Grain, CNQ, Write, and Red Rising Magazine. Joshua will be joined this evening by Vivek Shreya. Vivek's best-selling book, I'm Afraid of Man, was heralded by, Van City, by Vanity Fair as cultural rocket fuel, and her album with queer songbook orchestra, Part-Time Woman, was included in CBC's list of best Canadian albums of 2017. Her newest book, The Subtweet, a novel, was published to great acclaim in 2020. Vivek is one half of the music duo Too Attached and the founder of the publishing imprint VS Books, a Polaris Prize Music Prize nominee and four-time Lambda Literary, Literary Award finalist. Vivek was a 2016 Pride Toronto Grand Marshal, was featured on the Globe and Mail's Best Dress list and has received honours from the Writers Trust of Canada and the Publishing Triangle. She's currently a director on the board of the Tegan and Sarah Foundation and an assistant professor of creative writing at the University of Calgary. All right. Excuse me while I just go through these notes. One Book, One SFU began in 2015 as an all SFU reading experience that is at its core committed to the idea that libraries have a role in fostering ideas and facilitating dialogue toward a more just society. 
Every year we select a book and make copies available to our entire university community in Burnaby, Surrey and Vancouver. We conclude this university-wide book club with a free public event free featuring the author. We are very thrilled that tonight that author is Joshua Whitehead, the book is Johnny Appleseed, and the conversation includes the incredible Vivek Shreya, author of I'm Afraid of Men. Without further ado, I would like to invite Joshua Whitehead to do a reading of Johnny Appleseed. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Again, I'm going to into the elder for that beautiful opening. Um, I feel like I was. I told the, <laughs> the event organizers that um, Johnny has kind of been in the world long enough since 2018 that I've never got to read the ending of the of the novel aloud. Um, due in part to <laughs> not wanting to spoil, but I feel like we can tonight. So I'm going to read the ending sections for us. Um, and I might just skip ahead for the sake of time um, and jump straight to page 212 if you want to follow along, but also for the ASL interpreters, it's going ahead just a little bit, um, starting with the line, Kukum had this waddle, um, just so we can kind of get onto track here a little bit. So again, 212, beginning, Kukum had this waddle that made her look like a rooster. Um, so again, from the ending of Johnny Appleseed. Kukum had this waddle that made her look like a rooster, decorated with a pearl necklace. When I was a kid, she'd sit me on her knee and let me pick from one of two cookie tins she kept on her table. She was a tricky woman and would fill one with ginger snaps and the other with sewing materials. She took too much from Bob Barker, thinking all things had to be a damn gamble. Oh, it have to happen. Did great. Oh my God. On her lap, like I'd idiot. play with her I waddle. I not like any of the indigenous. Uh, and I think your mic is still on. <laughs> I'm sorry. Where was I? On her lap, I'd play with her waddle, and she'd fill her kitchen with that deep throaty bingo hall laugh all Cree women seem to have inherited. A sound so bellowing that you wonder how such a little woman could make such loud sounds from deep inside her belly. When she was older, I'd lay in her lap and look up at her dark prune-like eyes that caught the light in each of their folds. At her funeral, where I was a pallbearer, I learned her middle name was Maud, Frances Maud Sutherland. It felt like such a foreign language to call her anything but Cookham. All those syllables heavy as all hell on the tongue. But my cookum was light as air and as fierce as the rapids in her backyard. The church was afloat from the voices of all her kin singing gospels, a harmony of Indian voices orating about an old rugged cross and emblems of suffering and shame and crowns and blood. And it was funny, you know, my cookum, even in a casket made of oak and filled with sweet grass still felt light even for my femme boy arms but even still my arms shook like leaves i never did make it back to the res to hear that story from cookum the story of who i am she saved it for me after i left and i never made it back in time after some of my cousins turned their backs on me out there, said, if I ever returned to the res, they'd beat my ass. I really had no desire to return, especially without Jordan and Tias there. I wanted so much to hate Roger, who thought like them, and hate my mom for loving him, and hate the home that squeezed the queer right out of its languages. I think about my cookum a lot now. I wonder what she would have told me if she would have brought out that old sewing kit and made me a pair of slippers and said, just watch. What would she have said to me? The boy she raised and whose diapers she changed. The boy she bathed and kissed and taught all about porcupines and other sharp objects. What would she have said if she'd known I got naked on webcams and rubbed myself raw for a few measly bucks? Move in south, she hummed when I, was, when I told her I was leaving gonna be cold. Take these slippers, my boy. She handed me a pair, hand-knitted, green as the spikes of the evergreens mixed with wolf gray. 
Those slippers are still in my closet. And I think about all the folds, those colors, the way she would weave a hole big enough for your feet. All of this accomplished little by little. I think about what all went into those slippers, all those wishful thoughts, those hands that smelled of bannock and tea, NCFIM playing Loretta Lynn in between bouts of the entire res, wishing so-and-so a happy birthday during commercial breaks. I think of the skin and dirt and grit that stained deep into the grains of that fiber from her nail beds, the scent of her perfume, her tears, blood, saliva, cells, her stories, all of her wrapped up inside of that weaving. You know, they say South is the direction of youth, time of summer, healing, coming in, direction of the body, my boy. You're gonna be changing and that's fine, but you come back when you do, okay? You come back here and you change me too. We pinky swore and giggled like children, that smile of hers making me feel alive. At the celebratory feast for Cookham, we all sat at her table passing bowls of gravy and plates of bannock and stew. Even the chief showed up along with the neighbors, all my cousins, mama, Roger, my uncles and aunties. Seemed like the whole damn res was cooped up in that little three bedroom house that let hot winds blow through it like an open field. After our meal, all us Indians sat cross-legged on the floor looking like kids again, the WWE playing on the TV in homage to Cookham. We told stories and laughed, which may sound like a weird thing to do after the death of the matriarch who held us all together like a glue that couldn't quit. These days, I hear the house is empty mostly. We never got those same reunions save for Mother's Day and her birthday. Big old haunted house planted there in the middle of the res. Windows lined with dust, lights stained that old yellow hue, thin filaments on their last legs, everything screaming, witness me. You know, ni mama, she caught me one time with your papa, my mom said. Right there in front of the house, both just snapped and making out like sloppy old fish in the back seat of her old beat up wagon. She flashed the porch lights on and off to break us up and gave me the licking of a lifetime when I finally came in, tail between my legs like a damn res pup. I tell ya, well, that wooden spoon was bound to break in half, whipping against my ass, but that's just the type of person your cookum was, stiff as a goddamn board that never quit, fuck's sakes. We still even cook with that old spoon. And the room erupted in more laughter as we passed around stories like cigarettes. One of my aunties chirped in. Your papa told me she came out of that porch damn near bare ass with that spoon in hand. Chasing him off down into the bush, told him, boy, you better get. Come around here sloppy as that kissing my girl right in front of my home, will ya? And I swear, you never heard a room laugh so hard. Everyone turning into stand-up comedians all of a sudden. One of my uncles jumped in. Heard that next time your pops called, she told him, your woman's gone off to the powwow with the real dancer. Ain't no swindling pig like your slack ass, he said, half with burps and half in that res slang that made their speech sound as fast as the four-wheeler ripping through the hunting ground. Then your old pops comes around, sad as all hell with this right slack apple pie he picked up at Hudson's and tried to pass off his homemade like he's Mrs. Doubtfire or something. Mama was in that mode of laughing where she had to slap everything around her and throw her head back like it was about to roll off. Cook him ate his pie, put him straight to work, she said. Made him cut the whole damn yard with a push mower while all those res dogs nipped at him. I die laughing every time he used to tell me he had to cut the entire res's grass and kick at dogs that pounce up on his leg and just give her. Don't have a clue and, whole, and holy hell how that woman knew. Knew that my belly had you growing up in it, John. She beat time into our asses, whooped us up into real Indians. And then your pops, he goes up to her one day, says, hey, Francis. And you could see her veins just rise on her neck because everyone knows you only call her mama or cook em. And he says, 
can you like, you know, do it when you're pregnant? I mean, like, do you gotta be abstinent and all that for nine months? Cause it ain't safe. And mama, she calls me into that room. She says, Karen, you hear this boy. He thinks he's long John Silver. And we both laughed hard enough to get abs. Boy, she says, you ain't gonna hurt no one with that little pecker of yours. Today, Cookham is beneath a stone marker that says, in our hearts, you will live forever in a rickety cemetery overfilled with Indian people. I sit down cross-legged in front of her, feel the flattened prick of new grass poking into my calves, that fresh smell of severed blades and graft and growth all trying to mask the smell of trauma that always seems to permeate graveyards. The heat is beating down on me and my black t-shirt is soaking it all up. So I take it off, tuck it into my back pocket, bare chested. I wrap my arms around her tombstone, hold on tightly with my arms wrapped around its tip. I wanna tell you so many things, Cookham. Tell you, I think I made it, you know, traveled south and survived. I wanna say, I just hope I ain't changed too much, you know. Hell, I hope I ain't changed into no emblem of shame. And I know what you're gonna say to me. You're gonna say, humility, my boy, sacred teaching, don't you know? And I'll say, what humility got to do with shame? And you'll say, humility is just a humiliation you loved so much it transformed. And I'll say, the heck does that mean? And you'll say, boy, you ever swear at me again and I'll give you a smack upside that bean-shaped head of yours. Just look at these hands, you'll say. I'll look at them and see palms full of raggedness, lines intersecting every which way, cup of cosmos, bowl of infinite. Just watch, you'll tell me, just keep on watching. I watched too much, Cookham. Watched your body disintegrate back into a root. Watched your breath expunge and that little line flatten. Watched them all discuss how pulling the plug was the only gift we had left to give. The hell is left to watch, Cookham. I tighten my body around her, will myself to stone. Why you ain't take me with you? You said you'd never leave me be. Why'd you make me promise you to come back changed if you're gonna leave me before I do? Why'd you let me leave, Cookham? Why'd you never get that wooden spoon and say, boy, get your ass home and visit me right now? Why'd you let time whittle you to sand before you ask me home? Then I let loose a scream that threw those crows back into the sky and pounded my fist into the ground over and over, cutting my knuckles. I bleed into the earth beside her. Who the hell gonna love me now, Cookham? Who's gonna suck the pain from my skin? Teach me to love it into humility. Who, Cookham? Who? I cry myself into a stupor, lungs inhaling staccato breaths, and I lie there until the sun sweeps across the sky, less a beating heat, more a red morphing into pink, kissing the blue of the night pouring in on the horizon. Hey, Cookham, I'm sorry, you know. I never meant to hurt you. I never meant to forget those weekend calls and visit even less. Never meant to be drunk the last time I said I loved you. Before you got sick, couldn't talk. I never got to say thank you for all those stories you gave me that filled my belly. I'm sorry I let home become this, a stone and fields of grass and a tree. And I'm sorry, Cookham. I'm sorry I never got to show you how I transform. There's snot and tears on her headstone, which I wipe delicately with my t-shirt. I kiss her name and promise I'll come back, this time for real. I will a smile and head back towards home. Mama is sure to be wondering where the heck I am by now. I walk down the gravel road heading west, my shirt in my hand. The res is quiet tonight, save for the crickets chirping lullabies in the bush around us. The setting sun as kaleidoscope now. Every color crackling around its edges. 
The light dances on me. I can feel its dim heat swirl down my spine and settle into the rivulet on my lower back. It pools itself there while the new cold of the West makes my nipples harden into points. I look back and how far I've walked since I left Cookham, a couple of solid kilometers, my shadow now stretching across the road. And then I see it in the elongated shadows barreling from the east, a hunched woman holding my hand made from that elusive prism sky. And when I look down at my hand, I see only my t-shirt there, a shirt full of dried sweat, blood and phlegm, Maybe that's why the only bit of me I left was ghost. I guess that's all we left each other in Kukum, just each other's spirits. One for you, one for Mama too. Maybe that's why Manitou gifted me too. Manitou gifted me enough to travel out and in and all that space between, to weave like those old rapids do and to carry memories as a souvenir between this world and the fourth where I'll finally come home and have nothing but my glories to share with you. The only time an Indian pulls out their photo album is when someone dies. My dad's and ours. So was my Kukum and Mush and Rod. So now was Roger. Whenever we used to bring it out, my aunties and uncles all gathered around and talk stories. The album was our allowance to remember. Everyone came to see the photos with bannock and stew and dried meat in hand. We ate, we drank, we laughed and cried in unison. My cookum had a story for every photo, stories that redeemed even the alcoholics and the baby daddies, stories that love and scream in pain in equal measure. It's all there, we're all there. But here now, it's just us two. And there are blank pages for my mom and for me. When I look back at these old photos, I see my family come alive. I see their youth, but I also see them aging and dying and living their lives. It's overwhelming to think about all the stories we've helped made, helped to tell, helped to create. Our bodies are a library and our stories are written like braille on the skin. I wouldn't trade it for the world. I love the noise the liveliness of voices that are laughing, arguing, bingo calling, and telling stories in a two-packed home. In fact, I'd say that's my world. We're all here telling our stories in Indian time. But the ironic thing I've learned about Indian time is that it is an elixir of an excuse and a toxin of a measurement. It'll kill you, you know, if you love it, too dearly. And that's the truth. You know, Skonton. Thank you, my friends. I'm excited I got to read the end. <laughs> that's new for me. Hey, that was so beautiful. <laughs> um, before we get started, I just want to check in with you really quickly. Um, are you doing okay? And I'm, I'm really sorry about the comments that were made earlier. Are you okay to move over forward? I'm ready. Let's do okay. it. Great. Okay. So hi, everyone. My name is Vivek Shreya. I'm so thrilled and honored uh, to be in conversation with Joshua Whitehead tonight. I even dressed. This is as close as I get to a book look. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I tried to match. Um, I have so many questions for you and we don't have a lot of time. So and I know that other people have lots of questions for you as well. So I'm just gonna jump right in. And uh, I mean, first of all, big congrats on Canada Reads. I have to ask, where were you when you found out? Like, were you like on Twitter, like all of us or yeah, please take us through where you were. <laughs> I was in the backstage of Canada Reads oh. on like, the CBC and there was me and like, Francesca was also in Ron, like these little green rooms. And they're like, if you win, you're gonna be thrown into these interviews and you'll be live on the show. And I was like, okay. <laughs> um, so I tried to prepare this like speech and I had it ready and then, Devery was crying in the episode and then I started crying and they're like Josh and Juan and like you're live in three two and I'm like sobbing at this point one <laughs> they rolled me in and I was like okay Josh we're professionals um but yeah the entire 
speech I'd prepare was just muddled by pure emotions and gratitude and honor and thanks and so much love. And I feel like that was more genuine than anything I could have said. Incredible. I mean, I don't know, even your reading just now, like that section is like such a powerful moment in the book. Like, I don't know how you read it without sobbing. This is one of the first times you've read it live, right? Live. Yeah. I read, I did the audiobook version of it and I think it took me like 15 takes to even yeah. get yeah. through it. Yeah. Um, but it's a nice distance now that Johnny's been out for two years, that that passage is less difficult uh, and it requires less of me. Well, wow. it's more of an honor song now than it is a morning song. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for sharing for us. So I want to say for me as a queer writer, one of my agendas is to include queer sex somewhere in the work because there's still so much shame around queer sex specifically in the world. You know, people can be like, love is love, but like straight people do not want to see fags kissing in public. I do. Uh, you do, <laughs> but they don't. For and so what I loved about your book is just how much queer sex, specifically indigenous queer sexuality is woven through it right from page one. And secretly, I mean, I'm so like moved for you and proud of you and happy for you. But secretly for me, one of my, my deep joys about you winning Canada Reads is that like hundreds of Canadians are reading this book right now for this very reason. So first of all, I wanna thank you for doing this work. I really do think it's important work. Um, second, can you just talk a little bit more about this choice? Was it fun to, to write queer sex? Did you feel nervous about it? Like just sort of, yeah, if you can just, um, yeah, share with us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so during Canada Reads, one of the questions someone asked me, and I thought it was interesting, is what was the most difficult part about this book? Um, and they didn't prod into questions about like, tell me about your trauma or the real life experiences of death in your life. They just let it be that question. And I thought this was so beautiful because yes. usually it's paired with something else, like this kind of, as I call it, like literary voyeurism almost. <laughs> um, that's the point I was like, well, the most painful, the most difficult part about writing this book was because I had to write this book. Um, I just didn't see a text like this for me. Um, so I wrote it because I, I needed it personally. Joshua needed it. Like, this Joshua, like child Joshua, future Joshua, needed it, needed Johnny to be there with him. And in that kind of singularity, I feel like it always opens into universality, uh, the more kind of honed in it is, I suppose I would say. So with the queer sex and the queerness in Johnny Appleseed was one kind of like a, a I guess a calling in um, for other queer, two-spirit, trans, gender non-conforming, non-binary, indigenous folks to see themselves and to have this experience with Johnny. It's very much like virtual reality, I guess I would say. Um, but also because like I'm like bombarded by like non-queer sexual representation every day, everywhere I go, and advertisements driving down the road, listening to songs that for me like in the little world's eye house as a person, queerness and queer sex and queer intimacy um, and queer touch, all consent based are like very natural parts of my life and very much a part of my like love language that it would be a complete disservice and an obliteration to me, I would say, to not have those representations and to do it in a way that was natural to me that included that included like, you know, awkward topping scenes. <laughs> Love power it. bottom here for it here a bear it. top yes <laughs> semen and blood and snot and tears and all really of kind of thinking about all those fluids those are natural parts of our bodies and i just wanted to normalize those as well yeah well like i said i was so you know i i know that i'm not necessarily your target demographic but like i i felt so grateful for for all of that and i i do think that um you know, you might not see it as quote unquote a risk, but I do think the publishing industry can be quite conservative. And, uh, you know, I'm just so grateful for, for the, that, for those choices that you made. The other thing I loved about the book is how much pop culture you reference. And, um, you know, it's such a wide range. Like you have Benjamin Button, you have Liam Neeson Taken, you have Sesame Street, you have Babe Town Ryder Strong from Boy Meets World. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> exactly. And so I'm just curious about if you can say more about your choice to include pop culture references and if you feel like pop culture references are necessitated by a young adult protagonist. So what I mean by that is like if having a young pro adult protagonist means you have to have pop culture references and also a jump in question here is were there any pop culture references you references you edited out? 
Ooh, I feel like, well, first of all, like Ryder Strong, I have like probably <laughs> one of my first crushes ever. Uh, and I think like the Lion and Johnny is like the name Ryder Strong is like the best sex toy. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Which I still stand by. <laughs> it just sounds great. It feels great on the tongue. Um, so for me, like originally Johnny was intended to be young adult, um, but then also kind of was like, oh, this is a little more risque than when everything feels like the movies. Um, so I was like, okay, well, look, we'll publish it towards a novel. Um, but the stylistic choices I think that were made are, do kind of give it the aesthetic towards young adult, even if it's not fully kind of marketed in that sense. Um, but for me, like pop culture, and I think this kind of comes back to my academic side, is that I don't, one, that I don't believe in the borders between kind of province or nation living in this kind of sovereign space for indigenous nations in a space we call Turtle Island and then also globally as well for other indigenous spaces and peoples. And two, because of that, I also can't believe in the borders between genre or form. They all bleed into one another, creative, critical, or what we might think of as theoretical versus the creative, those bleed into one another. Um, my master's is in cultural studies. So for me, I find the most value and interest and worth and perhaps accessibility in talking about Judith Butler or Derrida or decolonial to like Jody Bird and like bringing it into the contemporary, bringing it into popular culture, because those are also very valuable cultural touchstones that we all know, at least some of them. Um, so for me, like that also is as theoretical as I might, might consider some of the kind of decolonial, you know, post-colonial queer theoretical readings I did to kind of craft this book. Um, and two, I don't necessarily think it's just the YA kind of protagonist who might necessitate something like popular culture. I also just, in my forthcoming nonfiction, I'm also doing that. I think it's just a natural methodology for me as a person to like have these touchstones and these markers because I didn't, Johnny doesn't have a last name. Like his real last name is not Appleseed. Uh, he doesn't have, he's not, there's no age really that's given in this book. Like I picture him as like 20 to 22. Mm. Um, and I don't really kind of set a specific time. So like for me, the popular culture, like those are like also like little tiny signifiers or markers of setting and temporality within the novel, but they're so vast. It's like from Loretta Lynn to like RuPaul's Drag Race. Exactly. <laughs> so like, I think all of those two like all of those little reference points are just like no nodes or modules that characterize him further that, you know, he's into like old school country music, but he's also like voguing to Donna Summer and, you know, <laughs> watching the most contemporary queer television. I love it. Yeah, I think that was so smart too, because you don't give us the age, but you give us such a range of pop culture. And so I found myself trying to be like, okay, this is a 90s reference. This is an early 2000s reference, like, how, like sort of trying to map it out. And then eventually I was like, oops, <laughs> Johnny is <laughs> age fluid. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, okay, so I have to, I want to talk to you about Mumbai Boy. <laughs> uh, you know, oh, let's book, do it. In the book, Johnny hooks up with someone called Mumbai Boy, who says to him, I've always had a thing for Indians, and Johnny responds, yeah, me too. And later, Johnny says, I wonder which of us is the real Indian. Um, you know, I've personally obviously grappled a lot with this tension of being Indian, especially being a settler as well. And I'm curious if you want to talk a little bit more about this rivalry Johnny, Johnny's character mentions with Asians with a, uh, a bit of brown and sort of your decision to include this character. For me, I, I, I was very uh, intrigued by the character and the inclusion of the character. So I, yeah, I'm curious if you have more you want to say about Mumbai Boy. I would love, no one's ever asked me that. Um, <laughs> so I, I guess what I was trying to do in characterizing Winnipeg um, and I would say perhaps some of the kind of, I would say BIPOC divisionary, invisible divisionary lines that Winnipeg does hold. Uh, and this is also coming out of like McLean's calling Winnipeg the most racist city um, in the world, basically in Canada. Um, was wanting to think about the kind of segregational, not segregate, but the, the invisible divisionary lines between racialized and classed people in in Winnipeg. Um, so Winnipeg is the largest urban reservation, but also between Winnipeg and my, my actual hometown, Selkirk, we have a large population of South Asian folks. And these were just conversations I remember hearing 
that I felt I was like necessary to include so we could have conversations like this, which is surprising me we didn't never have, even in Winnipeg, um, between perhaps quote unquote the rivalry between this, this like totemic and gifting moniker Indian or NDN and like thinking about who gets claimed to this like this title or who gets claimed to this identitary identitary name mm -hmm. um and so like i just remember like if you've ever been to winnipeg like portage place is like bump the most bumping spot ever specifically like lunch and dinner time uh and it's like very bipoc uh and i, I just love going there like kind of listening to the conversations uh and so a lot of the, the population i would say that kind of um, goes into Portage Place is a very classed, very racialized, very indigenous peoplehoods, I guess I would say. And like listening to these conversations, both in Winnipeg and in Selkirk between like the younger indigenous men primarily would be this like very strange rivalry that were like indigenous men are like fighting to have the name Indian. Um, and then also like thinking about that as a violent disservice when it is claimed by actually like South Asian or India, Indian people that I was like, this is a strange kind of dual consciousness that's happening mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. And I don't, what the, the realization and they're like theoretic, I guess they're just like modes of thinking around why that name and thinking about the violence of like being status Indian, what that means was so interesting to me. And I wanted to include it because one, it's a difficult conversation that I hear and have. And two, because it's so characterizing of, I would say, the kind of het cis masculinity of Treaty One indigeneity. Um, and it has caused a lot of kind of, I would say, troubling conflicts, both wow. in those spaces, Winnipeg and Selkirk, between the indigenous communities and like South Asian communities, including of many, that I just couldn't not have it. If I was going to be speaking about someone like Thelma Krull, who was, you know, a non-Indigenous white woman who went missing and had posters everywhere um, and was popularized, meanwhile, Tina Fontaine was happening, I couldn't also not include this difficult reality that I felt was so kind of laterally violent between these communities that yes. populate and love this space. Um, so Mumbai Boy was like, yeah, my little kind of nod to some of those like very strange dual consciousness moments of what I think Treaty One inhabits. Yeah, I think you encapsulated that tension and the lateral violence there so well, like their their interaction and the sex scene and all that stuff. I feel like you really, everything you just shared with us, I feel like you did such a great job of teasing that out. But yeah, thank you so much for your candor. You know, I, like I, I wanna go on and on with you here, but like our time is running out. So I'm gonna ask you one, I'm gonna like take up a little bit more of your time and then we're gonna open it up to audience questions. So for those of you in the audience yeah. who have uh, questions for Josh, I suppose I will uh, ask <laughs> one of your audience <laughs> questions. Um, so what I, I you know, um, yeah, anyways, there may be some other time I will ask you all the other questions, uh, you know, since we live here <laughs> together. Hey, just give me a ring, we'll talk. Yeah, okay. So <laughs> another, so there's so many lines in the book that just were like kind of a gut punch. I mean, you're, you're such a beautiful writer, of course, but there were some lines that just, you know, like I'm thinking funny how an NDN love you sounds more like I'm in pain with you. Or, you know, one of the lines I wanted to ask you about, we don't have time, is when I think of masculinity, I think of femininity. Like these are lines that really, really stood out to me. But one of the lines I also found interesting was love making was a term that wasn't part of my vocabulary. And the reason why it stood out to me is I believe that your next book is titled Making Love with the Land. And so I'm curious about this project and your evolving relationship with the phrase making love or love making. And also when is the, the book out so we can all pre-order it. <laughs> um, so it keeps getting pushed back because of COVID and busyness, but right now it is slated for spring, late spring, 2022. So stay tuned, I'm nearly finished. Um, and I can't wait just to like have the draft Start and start thinking about the fun aesthetics as you were talking about last night and like the aesthetics <laughs> of a book really are like the first delve into the reading. Totally. Um, so yeah, like thinking about like love and love making, I guess this for me um, comes both of, I would call it biotextual in like Joshua as a person, his experiences, and then imbuing that into Johnny as a younger person than me in these, in these like lands or like the space of Winnipeg would be, and also just thinking about queerness in large, 
pre-COVID, the, the before days, um, as BIPOC queer folks, is that we are automatically fetishized. Johnny is totally dealing with that. Um, we're like totemized as indigenous peoples when the this tribes that you can join, uh, we're exoticized. And then if we don't meet the mandate of their kind of projected illusion of what we are supposed to look like as queer, trans, BIPOC folk, we automatically are relegated to the side. Like no fats, no fams, no Asians, right? Yeah. And then, so for that, like it's, it's very much thinking about, I would say, disposability and consumption on the sake of of and for queer desire, which is where I might differentiate queerness. Although I do identify as digi in digi-queer, I don't identify as queer anymore because for me, it's still, still so wrapped up in the colonial project of settler colonialism that I might call it settler sexualities because queerness and LGBTQ plus rely so heavily on appropriation of two-spirit histories to co-opt them and then to like say, well, we've always been here because look, there's third, fourth, fifth genders on this land we live upon um, to the point that I would say like Stonewall is but a blip in the history of two-spirit history. Agreed. Which arcs back to originality versus how once begins and since 1492 on these islands anyways. So for love for me kind of is like removed from that disposability and that consumption. And Johnny plays within the maw of that consumption, but does so on his own terms, um, that I might characterize love less as the Western English linguistic term love, and then more so within Nehiawi, within the Cree language of Sagitin, which for me, and I think Johnny talks a bit about briefly, and then I explore further in the next book, is so much more between the kind of speech act of I love you, uh -huh. which also kind of brings in something like, when I say I'm in love with you, I'm also saying I'm in pain with you. Um, so like this, for me, in my understanding, is like a summoning of a being that, um, that requires animation, that requires kinship between, between the two or the mul multiples, and then reciprocity between all of that, that one automatically draws one into community with two or more, and then also requires consistent reciprocal work on the part of who's ever partnered within this kind of in the summoning of this being and becomes an animate thing and becomes something that we're like accountable to, which for me is so different from the ease and simplicity of just simply saying, I love this or I love you. Yes. Um, it automatically kind of brings in community engagement, um, again, between two or more, right? So for me, love, as it's transformed from each of these books, has become less a point of deploying love as a means of enacting desire, employing love as a means of participating in perhaps heteronormative or homonormativity and monogamy, uh, which are all these kind of different colonial projects inherent within queerness. And so for me, now love has become more of this being, this animate thing that is very decolonial, if I say sagitin versus love, and also becomes a kind of a sovereign thing that houses not only the joy of love, but also the trauma and the pain and the grievances of it as well. Um, I think like Billy Ray Belcourt in his most recent book says, if I'm, if I'm going to say I love you, I need to be prepared for my undoing. And I'm just paraphrasing, but it's like also encapsulating all of that into the messiness of this like this verb and this like act that we call love complicating it i yeah that's really beautiful i you know i really resonate with that as someone who i mean from a totally different culture but just you know in sanskrit the word love is prema and one of the things i really struggled with is like how do you love and prema are not the same thing and so how do you like, how do you subscribe to this English word? And anyways, I, I find that really, really interesting. And I'm really excited about your book. I also feel like I've taken up a lot of airspace. So I want to make sure that there's a little bit of time. They've let, they've let me know that we can go over a little bit. So if you, if you have energy, I'm going to ask you maybe one or two audience questions, if that's okay. Does that feel okay to you? Okay, great. So um, we have one audience question here. The novel is so full of beautiful poeticism. Was that a conscious choice? or more indicative of your writing process? The poetry arrives in the narrative and you can't deny the spirit or muse when it shows up. <laughs> I mean, so I wrote Full Metal, uh, everything's packed. Um, I wrote Full Metal in DigiQueer, which is this maybe perhaps like epic narrative poetry about this two-spirit cyborg trickster named Zoa. And when I released it, a lot of the reviews or like just like feedback I got was this isn't poetry, it's prose, Joshua. I'm like, okay, I oh, poetry annoying, to me. Annoying. <laughs> <laughs> and then I wrote this and people were like, 
this is it's too poetry. poetic to it's be poetry. prose. <laughs> <laughs> so who knows what they'll say when the nonfiction comes out, you know? <laughs> this is song, Josh. Yeah. Um. <laughs> it's a painting. It's a painting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. um, so for me, again, when we were talking about genre and form earlier and kind of division, invisible divisionary lines that the nation state has given to us. I would also say like when I'm writing, I don't call myself a poet. I don't call myself a novelist. I don't call myself an essayist or an academic. What I just call myself is an otachimo, which just means storyteller in Korea again, because storytelling encapsulates all these various different methods. If I could sing, I would also include that um, because I think what we can say what we want to say and the best way we can say it requires the multiplicities of storytelling forms and methodologies. And that should include all of them and not be bound singularly to like one. Um, so when I, I would say at the base of it all, the voice is like poetic, but think about the poetics of poet poetry, not so much the form of poetry, because that informs, I would say, all of my writing styles, even like how I talk most days. Um, and in that, in tell, wanting to tell the best story that I can and should tell, I have to kind of mix together the kind of the multitudes of these various forms that I've, I've learned, that I've been taught, and then bringing that orality to it and tying it all up with whatever form that the story wants to be told in. And I just listen, I guess I would say. I mean, beautiful. We are so grateful to you for your listening and also your willingness to share with us what you hear. So I think that's like a wonderful note for us to maybe end our conversation. I also know that you have a busy night tonight, so I don't want to keep you longer. Thank you so much for your generosity and just know that like for, you know, for every cheer you didn't get to hear, you know, uh, for your successes, like there's so many of us everywhere that are just constantly cheering for you and so happy for, for all of your successes. So thank you so much. And thanks for en en engaging in this conversation. I believe someone from SFU is going to like magically appear. Oh, Gwen, you're back. I'm so glad your internet got solved. I was worried about you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I would just yeah. say in leaving too, thank you so, so much for like, like, again, like you've asked me questions no one's ever asked me. I, I, I think that speaks to a lot of various different interviewers who've had me. Um, so thank you. I like love and adore you so much. And I'm a huge fan, as you know. So, so much hopefully love. we can see each other soon. Yes, and yes. go to shelf life and buy more nonfiction. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> oh my love. Uh... I'll see if my internet will hold <laughs> up. And fortunately, that is all we have time for this evening. Thank you, Joshua, for the reading. It was so wonderful to hear the ending of the book in your voice. And thank you, Vivek, for the inspired questions that drew out such a wonderful conversation. I hope you've both been able to see the love flowing in the chat. Uh, yeah, your yeah. conversation <laughs> was honest and truthful. It was painful, joyful, very queer, and full of love, just like the book. So thank you. Joshua, please accept my apologies for the tech failure in the opening and for the unmuted comments that came through, which I understand were inappropriate and painful. You are so gracious, but I'm very sorry that you had to be in your time with us tonight. I wanna offer thanks to the ASL interpreters, Carmel and Danica. Thank you to our event partners, SFU Public Square and Pulp Fiction Books. I would specific, uh, specifically like to acknowledge the following people who worked on this evening's event. Chloe Riley, Karen Monroe, Tony Liu, Deepa Barua, Anne McDonald from the library. Thanks also to Chris Brayshaw from Pulp Fiction Books and the awesome team at SFU Public Square, including Rachel, Kim, Seth and Janet. And thank you all for joining us. Most of all, thanks to Joshua and Vivek. Have a wonderful night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Till next time.